This seems like it's going to be too much. Is this too much? Is it going to be too much? I think it's going to be too much. Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. It's everybody's favorite day in their own shop. It's hashtag new machine day. It's been many, many years since I've acquired a new machine of any note, but today is the day. I've finally upgraded my loyal little PM25 benchtop milling machine to a shiny new Precision Matthews 728VT milling machine. My PM25 was a very loyal little buddy for me. I think it's an awesome little machine for anyone starting out. It's got a lot of great features at that price point, and it does really well. However, Precision Matthews has been frankly bothering me to try this thing out for quite a while now and full disclosure I'm going to go ahead and call this a hashtag sponsored video because they did send me that machine for free however I don't have any kind of deal with them I'm not going to be shilling for them I have a great relationship with them they're a great company but uh, they just sent me this machine because it was like hey you've sold a lot of machines for us over the years frankly without even trying it's not like I say their name on my channel ever but people figure out what machines I'm using and they go get them. So they wanted to send me this machine to pay that forward and give it a try. So I was happy to do that and I'm going to give you my honest review of it. So let's get this thing set up right now. Step one is to make some space to work in here. One of the nice things about having things on wheels in your shop is that even if you have a small space, you can temporarily create a bigger space as needed. So I'm going to roll my kitchen island out of the way here. I'm going to need to do some machine tool Tetris here to get the new mill in and the old mill out. Now I've got room to set up my crane here because the truck is going to be here any minute with the new milling machine and obviously I'm very excited about it. I'm going to set up some blocks here. The guy was nice enough to set the pallet on these blocks. He got his pallet jack as high as he could because the higher you can get the pallet off the ground, the easier it is to deal with with an engine hoist. The number one challenge with getting things off pallets with an engine hoist is getting around the legs of the hoist because the pallet doesn't fit between the legs. First impression here is that the machine is extremely well packed. It's on a small 30-inch pallet, more about that in a minute, which has been strapped to a larger pallet. And there's some boxes on top with goodies in them. Let's get the plastic wrap undone here. There seems to be zero damage on this crate, which is awesome and kind of rare for shipments that have traveled as far as this one has. I really hate popping these steel straps. It's always mildly alarming. I'm going to remove the top here because it's going to assist me with getting the smaller pallet off of the larger pallet. That's my first job here. So there's a bunch of lag screws holding on this shell here, which did a very nice job of protecting the machine. There's one place here where someone obviously hit it with a forklift and the fork did not make it through the crate. So the crate did its job and that's a good sign. The machine looks to be in excellent shape here. Tucked on the side here is the chip tray, which we will be using sort of later, as you'll see. And I'll get the plastic off here and look at that. That is a shiny new milling machine. Let's go through all the goodie boxes that were stuffed in around the machine here. Okay, so this is the display for the DRO. I ordered it with the DRO installed, but they don't put the actual display on the machine because it wouldn't fit on the pallet if they do that. And that looks to be the arm there that the display is mounted on. So we'll come back to that later. And then this box has some extra hand wheel parts, the hand wheel handles, and there's one spare hand wheel. This is where the power feed installs. So we won't be needing that. We'll put that in storage. Speaking of which, here is the power feed unit. And uh, ooh, it's brand new. That's exciting. I'm glad I didn't pay for a used one. This also ships separately so that the machine will fit on a small pallet. A quick note about this 30 inch pallet that the machine is sitting on. That's an unusually small pallet and I believe that's intentional based on the diagrams in the manual that they have done this so that the pallet will fit between the legs of an engine hoist. That might not sound like a big deal but it really is as you can see me here struggling to get the small pallet off of the larger one. Most machines that you buy ship on larger like 48 inch pallets or bigger that don't fit between the legs. So you always end up doing a bunch of this kind of prying and shoving and hemming and hawing, trying to get the machine close enough to the engine hoist so that the hook can lift it more or less straight up. And the 30 inch pallet really solves that problem. Unfortunately, it looks like one of the regional carriers that touched this thing between Precision Matthews and me strapped it to a larger pallet. And so that's why I'm dealing with this here. I wasn't really getting very far with the crowbar there, so what I decided to do was put a little bit of upward tension on the mill at an angle using a long strap here. And this is going to take some of the weight off of the machine so that I can kind of slide it a lot easier towards the machine. 
You wouldn't want to try to lift it like this because the machine's going to try to tip over and it's going to be chaos. But if you just put a little tension on that strap, that's often enough to where you can slide it to where you need. So a little bit of tension combined with a little bit of crowbar assistance there allowed me to pull it in close enough to be under the hook and above the legs on the engine stand. You can also see how much assistance I got from having the guy put the base pallet on some blocks to get that as high as possible. Definitely talk your freight driver into doing that if you can. Now that it's on the legs, I can get rid of the larger pallet and now we're home free. So now I can wheel it over to the side here because I need to get it out of the way so that I can get my old mill off the bench and prep things for the new mill. Thus begins Machine Tool Tetris. Actually, I guess this is more like Machine Tool Sokoban. Anybody remember Sokoban? It was a video game where you had to push the blocks around in a warehouse, but you could only push things, you couldn't pull them. Anyway, look, there's a video game metaphor in here somewhere, okay? Next step is to unbolt the old machine from the steel bench here where it's held down with four grade eight bolts, which is ridiculous overkill, but you never know, I might have needed to someday lift the entire building by that machine. All right, time to lift this machine off of here. It's kind of funny, I just set it on here about four months ago, something like that, when I moved into this shop, but it's just how the timing worked out. It's time to move it once again. The good news is I'm getting very good at moving these machines around. I did this move in about half the time that it took me the first time I did it many years ago. Of course, always follow the instructions for how to lift your machine. It's really important that the straps go in the correct place, usually under the head for a column machine like this, but you really got to make sure that the straps aren't hitting any wiring or the electrical box or DRO scales or kip handles, anything like that. Machine tools are simultaneously very, very skookum and also very, very fragile. Once I'm clear of the bench, I lower it down onto a board on the foot of the crane here, which makes it nice and safe and very, very easy to move around the shop. So I'll stick it over in the corner here on some blocks, once again out of the way, so that I can swap in the new machine. I'm taking some measurements off the machine here. The crucial distance that I'm concerned about is the distance from the bolt hole to the back of the hand wheel. It's really important to have meat hook distance around the back of the hand wheel so that you can wrap your hands around it without hitting the front edge of the bench. I'm using the chip tray as a drilling template here. I think chip trays under milling machines are strictly decorative, so I'm not actually going to use it, but it does make a handy drilling template. I don't have one of them there fancy mag drills, so I do it the old fashioned way by standing over the drill with your body weight and using the BMX handle on a corded drill. Modern cordless drills are amazing, but there are some jobs for which you still need the cord. That DeWalt corded drill is a beast. That thing will break your arm. And for drilling big holes in steel like this, boy, it's nothing like it. I have run a 2 inch hole saw through 3 16th plate with that drill and it didn't even sweat. Okay, here we go. This is the fun part. Time to get the new milling machine into position. This machine is noticeably heavier. You can feel it on the crane and you can see how much bigger the castings are. In fact, here's a little side by side of the two machines. You can see that the column is much bigger. The base is much thicker. The table is thicker. There's about an extra 100 pounds of cast iron in this new machine and you can really see it and feel it. Also, you can kind of see in this side by side here that the head on the 728 is a good 40% larger. Like it's very, very beefy looking compared to the PM25. but it's still well within the 500 pound weight limit of an engine hoist on full extension like this, so that makes it really easy to move around. It's part of why I like these hobby machines. They're a really good size for folks that are working alone and don't need a whole lot of machine. And touchdown. Looking good. Now you can see why I never put a cabinet above my milling machine like I had in the old shop, because in the back of my head, I kind of knew someday I was maybe going to end up with this mill, and it's quite a bit taller than the old one. The secret to lining up the bolt holes on the machine is to keep some tension on the crane to take most of the weight, and then just shove it around and get some tapered punches in a couple of the holes there. Once you've done that, you're home free, you can set it down, and then those tapered punches are going to let you muscle the machine around to get all four bolts in quite easily. Once again, having done this a bunch of times, I've gotten very good at it. And here's that meat hook clearance I was talking about. That's really important because if you're feeding slowly, it's often important to get both hands on the wheel rather than using the crank handle. You don't want to be hitting your knuckles on the edge of the bench. I set the old machine on the crate that the new one came on because it's such a nice little crate. You can see how it works with the crane. 
and I'm going to be prepping this one for sale. It has a new owner already as of this recording, and he's coming to pick it up shortly. I'm going to put a heavy coating of whey oil on everything just to keep anything from rusting. It's not going to be in storage for too long, otherwise I might have packed everything in grease, but I think a heavy oil here will be good enough for this trip. And I reused all the packing materials from the new mill as well, because why not? It was so well packaged and the new mill fits nicely on the pallet. Again, if I remove the power feed, which is easy to reinstall, and I even reused the lag screws that came with the new mill. There we go, all ready for the new owner, and now I can wheel my cabinets back into place and get my shop space back. Now it's time to clean off any shipping oil or protectant that might be on all the precision surfaces. Depending on whether it's fresh off the boat or it came from a reseller, there might be oil on it, there might be grease, there might be cosmoline, there might be some kind of knockoff cosmoline. I've seen wax. I've even seen tooling straight from China coated in used motor oil, which is very distinctive smelling, so you know when you got that. In this case, it looks like it's just whey oil. I suspect Precision Matthews did that themselves, so it's easily cleaned off with WD-40. If you get something more stubborn, like some of the cosmoline knockoffs are really hard to clean off, then brake cleaner works extremely well on that. Once everything is clean and dry, then I put my own new coating of white oil on everything. And don't forget the lead screws. This shot also gives you a nice view of the ways. They are extremely high quality. They look to be extremely well ground. A marquee feature of this machine is that the ways are all scraped in, as you can see on the underside here, which for a hobby machine is pretty remarkable. That's not something you typically see. You can also see the oiling passages there. I'll be talking about the oiling system here in a minute. I will say also I'm not a huge fan of the giant neoprene sheet that's acting as both a table way cover and a column way cover. It's not really very effective at catching chips, I don't think, so I'll probably replace this with a box accordion style at some point. Interestingly, the hardware is already there to mount such a way cover, but for some reason it doesn't include that. The details on this machine are noticeably improved over the 25. For example, it has these nice little uh, telescoping lead screw covers. And these are actually aluminum, not plastic, so that's a really nice little detail. And the kip handles are also aluminum, not plastic, like they were on the 25. The belt cover is also much improved. It's a heavier sheet metal, and instead of having four fiddly little bolts to remove, it's actually hinged with a quick release on one side for really easy access to the belts, and also for the drawbar. The first step on the break-in procedure for the mill is to remove the drawbar, so that's easily done here. Just pull that cap off, drawbar pulls straight out. You also have to make sure that the belt is on the slower speed for the break-in. This one shipped on the higher speed, so that's easy to move that down there. And then pull out the e-stop, power up the electrical box there. Then we turn the spindle up to somewhere between 300 and 400 RPM, and just let it sit there for a full minute. This is the spindle bearing break-in procedure, and it's very simple. The spindle sounds really nice on this machine, noticeably smoother and nicer than the PM25. After a minute, then we crank the speed gradually up to the full spindle speed, which is 1800 RPM on the slower belt speed. And then test the e-stop, make sure that works. And indeed it does. I actually thought the drive system in this mill was the same as the PM25, but it's obviously not. The ratings on it are the same, but this is definitely a different electrical box. The contactor is larger and slower, which is uh, interesting. So you have to use this one differently. You don't just power the mill up and down to start and stop the spindle. You leave the electrical box powered up and you use the forward reverse knob to stop and start the spindle. Because the electrical box actually takes several seconds to shut down. I assume that's due to the big contactor in there. So that's a little bit of a different experience, but it's clearly a different drive. I hope it's a better quality one. It certainly sounds better, and it sounds smoother and nicer. It also has a much wider RPM range. There's an extra 600 RPM on the lower belt and an extra 2000 RPM on the upper belt, which is really nice for small drills. So I think that's going to help me uh, break a lot fewer tiny drills on my modeling projects. The Quill DRO unit is different as well, and actually I think it's worse. The viewing angle on the LCD is really poor. The numbers are dim unless you're really down low and looking straight at it, so I don't love that. And it's got an auto shutoff on it, which is a nice feature on a digital caliper. On a Quill DRO, that's super annoying because doing a lot of long operations, the Quill isn't moving, and so the Quill DRO shuts itself off. 
I've already been annoyed by that multiple times, so I might do some hacking to see if we can work around that or swap out that unit. I don't know, we'll see. One of the marquee features on this machine is the one-shot oiler, which is quite a fancy feature for a hobby machine like this. I'm pretty excited to give this a try. I assume the reservoir needed filling, but it turns out it was actually already half full. The oil in it was very clean, so I couldn't see it on the sight glass, but I started filling it up and it almost immediately overfilled. So I guess that's good. It had oil in it. The tubing is dry though, probably because it's been sitting for a while. Taking a look at the tubing here, you can see one line comes off the reservoir into a little manifold here, and this feeds the X and Y table slides. There's lines that go over to each side of each way. And then there's a second line off the reservoir that comes up to the column, and then there's another little manifold that feeds both sides of the Z way. Notably, the lead screws are not fed by this oiling system, so you still have to manually oil those. But I gave it a few pumps here just to make sure all the tubing was full. You can see it oozing out of the ways there, so the system is definitely working. I pumped it up until the furthest tube from the reservoir was showing oil inside it, and that system uh, seems pretty nice. It's going to be nice for oiling the ways. The pump handle feels really good, and it seems to work really well. So I'm pleased with that feature. Next up is to adjust this little set screw inside the quill. This set screw acts as the key for the R8 collets, and for some reason, both machines that I've received from PM, this little set screw is always in too tight. I don't know why the factory does that. Maybe they're using different collets to test them. I don't know, but... I always find it needs a little adjusting. That worked great for all of my collets except my three quarter inch R8 collet. And this collet has always been a little ornery. It's a little bit sticky in my PM25, but it always went in. However, on the 728, I could not get this collet in. No amount of wiggling or adjusting the key would get this collet in. And I think that's actually credit to the 728. I think what that means is that the quill taper is better ground in this machine than it was in the 25. So I had to go and uh, do a bunch of stoning on that one ornery collet. I deburred everything and made sure everything was chamfered. And after some cleanup, then it started going in okay. It's still a little sticky, so I might actually replace this one collet. Then, of course, comes everybody's favorite job, tramming the head. I'm not going to go into general tramming procedures here. I've got lots of videos on that. Check out my mill skills playlist, for example. What I will say, though, about this machine is one of the other signature features of it is that it has a worm drive tram adjustment. Instead of having to do the tappy tap hammer, you can just put a wrench on this worm screw. So this was new to me. This is kind of a, a high-end feature for a hobby mill. It's not something you see a lot at this price point, so it's pretty cool to see it. It takes a little getting used to. There is a fair bit of backlash in that worm screw. So it took me about 20 minutes to get it trammed in because I was getting used to how that worm drive works and behaves. But I got it to within 5 tenths over 25 inches, so I was pretty happy with that for tram. Next up is the DRO display. The bracketry is pre-installed there, which is nice. And I will say this bracketry is a lot nicer than the stuff that came on the PM25. Weirdly though, the hardware was missing for this one bit of bracketry here. Luckily, it just needed some M61 cap screws, which is very, very common. And I'm sure I have those in my box and I only needed two. So of course I had one. For now, the back will be secured with a crappy bolt and I will replace that when I remember to do so 20 years from now. The arm goes on with some nylon washers and a nylock nut, which all together allow you to set the tension on this hinge, which is great because I want it extremely tight. I never want this thing to move while I'm pushing the buttons on the display, which is super annoying. The display comes with this bracket that you bolt on, and then the whole thing bolts onto the end of the arm. I'm not sure if I got the stack of washers just right there, but I don't know. That seemed to work. Seems fine. So this is their new display that Precision Matthews is shipping, and we'll see how good this thing is. It certainly looks flashy. It's got the LCD display and everything. I haven't used it much yet, but first impressions are mixed. I will say that the display refresh on it is quite low, which is pretty annoying. It's a bit like playing a video game with a low frame rate, which when you're power feeding towards a number that you're trying to hit could be pretty annoying. It also came with a whole bunch of beeping enabled by default that I turned off. So we'll see. The jury's still out on this. I won't be surprised if I replace this with a Touch DRO in a couple of months. Here's a really easy test you can do for weigh quality and gib adjustments. Run the table all the way down to the end on X and then crank the Y forward and back. And when you do this, the Y axis should feel just the same as if the table's in the middle. On the PM25 it didn't, the table gets noticeably heavier when it's off to one side like that. It's not unexpected for a hobby grade machine, but I will say this machine, the Y axis feels identical even when the table is swung all the way over like that. So that actually speaks really highly of this machine in terms of the build quality of the ways and how well the gibs are fitted from the factory. I really didn't see any need to adjust anything here. So I'm pretty impressed with that I will say. 
Down on the hand wheels, in lieu of the traditional friction collars, the collars have these little plastic handled set screws on them. I'm honestly, I'm not a big fan of that, I gotta say. I'll probably just remove those. I don't really use the hand wheel collars anyway with the DRO, so they just kind of seem in the way. The kip handles on the table though here are really nice. The big feature here is that when they're in the down position, they clear the base of the saddle. And that's something that the PM25 did not do. And so if you forgot to keep them in the up position when you're feeding on Y, it was very easy to catch them and break them. I'll also point out the way wipers on this machine are very, very nice. They're very accurately made and they seem to do a really nice job of keeping chips off the ways. The PM25 didn't even have way wipers, so this is a really nice upgrade. On now to the brand new power feed. As I said, it comes uninstalled for space reasons, but it's easy to install. This is the drive gear that comes with it, and I have to say I'm shocked at the quality of this thing. This is not a cheesy, centered metal gear like you would expect. This thing is machined and ground to within an inch of its life. I'm not sure why this gear is such high quality. It doesn't really need to be, but it's a very impressive piece anyway. So that just slides on in lieu of the hand wheel. Tighten that set screw down. Piece of cake. Then there's this two-piece bracket which installs on the end of the table. This is the same as the PM25 one was. I don't love this installation method. It just clamps onto the end of the coolant reservoir on the table, which is certainly functional. The problem with this is that it blocks one end of the T-slots. There's a little bit of space there, but no longer enough to get a T-nut in on that side of the slot, which is actually super annoying in practice. So I think I may actually mill some clearances on that bracket. I was hoping they'd improve that with some other mounting system, but here we are. Then the outer half of the bracket lifts off, it's just slotted there, and this half bolts onto the power feed unit. This is also adjustable, so you can line up the spur drive there with the other gear. Then the whole unit just slides back down, and then those slots allow you to set the backlash between those two gears. Easiest way I've found to do this is to snug up the bolts in the upper position, and then just tappy tap tap it down with a hammer, checking it as you go until the backlash feels right. You're looking for a position where the gears run quietly and smoothly. A lot of people will tell you put a piece of paper between the gears to set backlash. I personally don't find that works, so I just do it by sound and feel. A little bit of devil's toothpaste on there will complete the job. Why is it that the worst smelling petroleum product that humans have ever come up with, wheel bearing grease, comes in the chintziest cardboard tubs with totally non-functional lids that do nothing to contain smell or spill? It's a mystery. Next to go on is the very important cover for those gears. Your hands are frequently in that area, so this cover is definitely not optional. Unfortunately, the cover here is plastic and it's held on with double stick tape. This is a notable downgrade from the PM25, which had a sheet metal cover that clipped in place so you could remove it anytime you needed. If I ever have to remove that cover, I'll probably drill and tap some holes to bolt it back on, but for now the double stick tape will work. Okay, moment of truth. Let's power it up and give this a little test run. Right off the bat, it sounds and feels much smoother and quieter than the older one on the PM25 does. So that's definitely an improved unit there. I like that a lot. It runs very, very nicely. The acid test of a power feed though is how slow will it run and will it run consistently at those low speeds? So this is about as slow as I could get it to run and still be consistent and smooth. And that's pretty impressive. That's slow enough for a fly cutter. So that's actually quite good. And then a quick test of the rapids. Again, nice and smooth and noticeably quieter than the previous unit, so that's definitely an upgrade. Last step to install that is to get the limit switch on here. This limit switch just bolted right up, which is also a big improvement. The one on the PM25 was comically ill-suited. Every single part of it had to be re-engineered to fit. I did a whole blog post about making that power feed limit switch fit on that mill. It was clear no one had ever tried to install it. It comes with these little standoffs to act as stops. So I'll put those on and just check it. And I set these so that it'll hit that stop before the table gets to the end of its travel there. These stops are plastic, which is not great, but the mill came with metal stops. So I might just put those back on. These stops are just a safety thing anyway. In my experience, they're not repeatable enough to be used as a machining stop. So I just set them at the ends of the table to keep myself from getting absent-minded with the power feed running. Here's a fun practical joke to play on your friends. Set the stops like this, and now your power feed is useless. All right, maybe that's not that funny. Look, you try coming up with machining jokes every week for four years, all right? It's not that easy. One curious absence on this machine are any markings on the table. The PM25 had them. I don't know why this one doesn't. 
I went ahead and marked a center line on the table because it's nice to know where to put your vise. I don't really use the table markings for anything other than that, so that's fine, I guess. Interestingly, the T-slots on this mill are ever so slightly smaller than on the PM25. I don't know why, but they are. But the T-bolts for the vise still fit, so let's bolt that up and get that trammed in. I'm using the power feed and smack method that I've shown many times before. This allows you to tram your vise in about four seconds flat once you get a little bit of practice with it. Just like that, we're within a couple of tenths over four inches. Okay, time for first chips. First little project on this mill is going to be to shave ten thousandths off each side of all of my T-nuts because they don't quite fit. My T-nuts were all pretty close fitting. They're all shop made on the PM25 and they don't fit in this machine. So first chips were tiny, but hey, first chips is first chips. All right, but now let's test the thing everybody really wants to know. How is the rigidity on this one compared to the PM25? I've got a scrap of 1018 steel here and I made a flat spot and I'm going to do some test cuts. First test cut here is a 50 thou depth of cut, full width on a half inch end mill. It's running at 950 RPM and you can kind of gauge the feed rate from the hand wheel in the background there. This is about the maximum cut that you can do on the PM25 comfortably. And I will say this machine cruised through it without even feeling it. One thing that's not so bueno here though is that the cutting forces pulled the quill down three thousandths during that cut even though the quill was locked. So I don't know if the quill lock needs more muscle on it or if it needs some breaking in, I'm not sure. I did find it helps a bit to back the depth off a touch to get out of the backlash on the worm drive there on the fine feed before locking it. That reduced this issue, but this is something that I'm going to have to keep an eye on and see if this is something that's going to get better over time or, or, or what. It doesn't do it on light cuts, of course, but even on a heavy cut, you don't want it to be pulling the quill down like that. That's not a great thing. The PM25 never had this issue, so I'm not sure what's different about the quill lock on this one. Next up is a 75 thou pass. Once again, full width on a half inch cutter, same feed rate, same RPM, about 950. And this is a carbide cutter of eh, unknown sharpness. And once again, I will say it powered through this no problem at all. There was no vibration, no hesitation. That worked great. So going down from there then, I'll do a 100 thou pass. This is double what the PM25 could ever do on steel. And this, ooh, this was no bueno. Once that thing fully engaged, the mill started shaking itself off the bench. So 100 thou, definitely too much in steel. I lowered the feed rate a little bit just to see if it was happier with that, but no, the thing is shaking itself to pieces here. So that's definitely too much. I'm going to go ahead and say 75 thou in 1018 steel with a half inch cutter is probably the limit you'd want to go on this machine. Maybe you go to 80 or 90, but 75 thou is lots for a hobby machine. And the manual claims you can run a one inch cutter in this machine. I would not run a one inch cutter on it. For larger surfacing operations, I would stick to insert facing cutters with light cuts or shell mills or the old school way, which is a fly cutter. Fly cutter is the best option for small machines like this. It's the lowest tool pressure way to create large flat surfaces. One other random little annoyance is that the lead screw covers, which I quite like, don't stay in place. And they have a tendency to keep sliding out like this, so I'll probably drill and tap a little set screw in that to hold it in place. So to summarize, obviously if you've looked at their site, you know that this machine has a substantial price premium over the PM25, and the question is, is it worth that premium? I think the answer is yes. The thing about this machine is that while it has a lot of those little annoyances that I've pointed out, where it matters, the quality is there. The slides are very well machined and ground. Everything runs really smoothly. Everything is tight and smooth. The castings are heavier noticeably. The machine is noticeably more rigid. It's got better travel on the y-axis and the quill and the Z column. And those are the areas where I always ran into limits on the PM25. So where it really counts, the machine is a lot better. A lot of the little stuff that I don't like about it can definitely be fixed. And overall, I think if you've got the budget for it, I do think this machine is a worthy upgrade. Well, I hope this review and setup had something useful in it for you. Thank you so much for watching. And thanks to my patrons for making all of these videos possible. Thanks to Precision Matthews for sending this machine my way. Once again, this is kind of hashtag sponsored, but I tried to be honest with my opinions of it for you. And I will see you next time.